U.S. and Chinese negotiators faced off over the future of the Kyoto Protocol in Bangkok today, with the U.S. arguing for a new protocol and China insisting the old one be kept intact. The European Union is siding with the U.S., which proposed a new protocol in June. The new one would give all nations some responsibility for limiting climate change emissions, while Kyoto puts that burden solely on the nations industrialized in 1997. Developing nations support China's insistence that Kyoto is, quote, not negotiable. The issue emerged into the open in today's session with some observers fearing that it could derail the entire climate treaty process. But UN Climate Chief Evo de Boer told Agency France Press that he sees real movement on a compromise that could incorporate the best parts of Kyoto into a new agreement that all nations could ratify. For more now, to go a little bit more in depth here, we're going to turn to our executive editor, Margaret Ryan, has been following these talks all along. What is the argument here? We know Kyoto is expiring. Well, Kyoto's obligations expire in 2012, but the assumption always was that the next set of obligations would be negotiated as people saw what uh, accomplishments were made uh, under Kyoto. Recall, this is just a protocol. This doesn't disturb the 1992 treaty, which was signed in Rio by President George H.W. Bush. Uh, under that climate treaty, all nations do acknowledge the dangers of climate change. They do acknowledge they need to do something about it. The 1997 Kyoto Protocol was the first kind of fruit of that treaty, and it was the, the first time that nations undertook obligations under it. In this case, however, it was only the richest nations. They, uh, the treaty, the protocol, I'm sorry, not the treaty, uh, kind of divides the world into what's called the Annex I countries. Those are the wealthy industrialized nations and the whole rest of the world. Now, the U.S. never agreed to and agreed to this. It, it probably won't. Even John Kerry has said that even Obama can't go to Copenhagen and promise that. So the U.S. has proposed a new protocol. Uh, so have so several other states, including Australia, to acknowledge that things have changed since 1997. So what, what is different about the U.S. proposal? Well, it says everyone commits to something. You know, some measure. It, you know, the U.S. negotiators say, hey, we recognize that, uh, you know, a de poor developing nations cannot commit to the kinds of things, say, the U.S. could commit to. But everybody has to take some responsibility in this. Um, it really, you know, it really acknowledges the shift that's occurred in those countries that have no obligations under Kyoto. I mean, you look at China, which has now surpassed the U.S. in total greenhouse gas emissions, and right behind them, Brazil, India, Indonesia, uh, the U.S. just says, look, you can't control greenhouse gas emissions if countries like this have no obligations whatsoever. And I think effectively the governments of all those countries have recognized that in some way. The issue is, what are they going to commit to? to in an international treaty, because under an international treaty, you want a verifiable commitment. You have some obligation to let outsiders uh, audit this. And that's where China, particularly, and India are, you know, whoa, right. no, we, we don't think we want to do that. And then the other issue is poorer nations uh, expected under Kyoto, they'd see a lot more projects coming their way, a lot more money coming their way uh, for as, as under the, the various mechanisms that were in that in the Kyoto Protocol, like the the CDM and so on, and and a lot of that hasn't materialized. Right. So I mean, the big one of the big unresolved issues here is a financing mechanism for developed countries to to help the uh, developing countries mitigate climate change. Money going from rich to poor is that addressed in the U.S. proposal? It isn't really because the the proposal that we have to uh, to get the framework of responsibility set in place before you decide this financing mechanism. And you're right, this is a big, big issue. Uh, you know, many but don't, the, don't yeah. the developing countries want just the opposite? Uh, they want just the opposite. And, and I mean, I think the U.S. They want is the trying to say first, and the finance. They want the financing right. mechanism first, responsibility the second. They say when we are developed, when when we have the SUVs, then we'll undertake. Right. Uh, you know, when when our, all our people have electricity, India points to as 40 percent of his population doesn't even have a socket, you know, and says, uh, says, hey, you know, until we're up to your level or closer to it, we shouldn't have any obligations. That's the official stance anyway. Uh, but, you know, Kyoto, and there was this promise of money held out effectively in Kyoto. It did not materialize in part because the, uh, the European Union, which was the main place where these obligations were recognized, they set up a carbon trading system and then they vastly over allocated and they didn't need as many offsets. And so, you know, many of these countries feel they're really owed. There's a real sense when you're at these talks mm -hmm. of people being owed, you know, we're, we're sitting here until that money starts right. coming in. And uh, they want it with 
no strings attached. You hear people openly from delegates from those nations saying, you know, we, you send it to us, we don't have to account for it, we'll decide how best to spend it. Uh, this is the kind of thing. I think the financing mechanism really won't be decided before Copenhagen. They may get to the point, uh, I, you know, I hope for the progress of the treaty, of, uh, they get to the point of being able to talk about responsibilities and joint responsibilities because, frankly, the 1992 treaty does give everybody responsibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, that language uh, is not new, but uh, you know, if the countries go into Copenhagen still not agreeing that everybody has some piece of this action, then it may be very, very difficult to go very far in Copenhagen. As it is, even if they make the agreement, the lead, I think it's the world leaders who will be agreeing on any financing mechanism there. Right. So, I mean, we have Bangkok. We still have Barcelona talks yes. coming up. Also, bilateral talks uh, between the U.S. Oh. and China, U.S. and India. Right. Do you expect an, uh, any more significant progress there? I think those are the places where progress is really going to be made. It's going to be in bilateral uh, agreements. It's going to be because you have all this posturing that happens at talks like Bangkok. And then on the side, you have, you know, China saying, well, maybe we'll do this. And India saying, well, hey, maybe you, we heard some progress from them a week ago when they were talking about we're not going to be the deal breakers in Copenhagen. Uh, they don't want to be left behind right. in this. So you, you have a lot of different movements going on. You do have G20 meeting coming up before then. There are quite a few fora where progress may in fact be made, uh, but uh, you know, we really won't know how far it's gone and whether it's, got, it's really getting anywhere until Copenhagen. Right. All right. Well, we will be covering all that progress in our countdown to Copenhagen. Margaret Ryan, thank you.